Hi there, welcome back. Or for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. We are glad you could join us today. I am Rachel McCarthy and I'm the National Training and Outreach Coordinator for the First Detector Program. Before we get started, I would like to review a few, a few housekeeping items. We are recording the session today and we'll post the link afterwards. Please revisit the content anytime and be sure to share the link and information with friends and family to help spread the word about Oak Wilt. If you have a question during the presentation, please use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. We may answer the questions as we go or hold them for discussion at the end of the presentation. If you experience technical problems with your video or audio, please use the chat box to let us know. If you raise your hand, we are unable to chat to you individually, so please use the chat window if you have a problem or use the question box if you have a question for our speaker. So joining us today to talk about Oak Wilt is Dr. Brett Ahrens from the University of Minnesota. Brett is the director of the Plant Disease Clinic and a member of the faculty in the Department of Plant Pathology. I'm now going to hand the floor over to Brett, who will share a bit more about his, himself and his background before jumping into today's topic on Oak Wilt. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, so uh, as Rachel said, my name is Brett Ahrens. I am the director of the Plant Disease Clinic here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I've been the director for about six years now. And um, so just to, for people to bear in mind what the information, some of the information I'm going to be sharing um, today definitely comes from um, our, our geographic perspective. So I'm more familiar with the situation of Oak in Oakville in the upper Midwest and in Minnesota, but I'm still going to try to share information that pertains um, to the rest of the US. Uh, I'm also a teaching assistant professor in the Department of Plant Pathology, so I teach a variety of classes. Um, in the department pertaining to plant pathology, ecology, plant disease management, um, things like that. So why am I talking about oak wilt today? Well, oak wilt is actually um, one of the most common types of samples we get in, the, in our plant disease clinic here. And um, the reason that is, is because of course, it's a very important disease. Um, it can be important in a number of different levels. First of all, uh, we have a lot in the, in the University of Minnesota here. We're based in Twin Cities area, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, a lot of uh, urban homeowners that have um, prized shade trees. Oaks, of course, are one of the um, most prized. You know, they're very slow growing, um, get very large trees. And just as an example here, you can see in the background on the screen, you know, this is a tree that has been killed with oak wilt. That is a tree that might have raised the, the property value of that um, for those folks by thousands of dollars. And um, the cost to actually remove a dead oak tree can be another um, several thousands of dollars, depending on what, uh, what they actually need to do. So it can be a really devastating disease for a um, homeowner that has prized oak trees. But of course, um, it can also be quite important for here. Okay, for um, the natural ecosystem as well. So this is an aerial photograph of an expanding oak wilt pocket. Oaks, um, of which there are many um, species in the U.S., um, are a very important component of a lot of different forest ecosystems. And um, especially in areas where you have really dense oaks next to each other, oak wilt can get into that area and move um, in this expanding area to cause uh, quite a bit of mortality. It's been estimated that oaks are um, responsible for about a third of North American forest um, biomass. So a really important tree on the ecological level. So oak wilt is an important disease, not only for homeowners, but also for our natural ecosystems. So a little bit about oak wilt, um, just sort of the basics of the disease. Of course, it is a fungal wilt pathogen Bretziella fagaciarum is the name of the pathogen. It's actually a relatively new name. It was uh, renamed just in the last two or three years. The old name is Ceratocystis fagaciarum. So if you're looking at oak wilt literature, um, trying to educate yourself on it, you're probably more likely to come across the old name. 
but just to avoid um, any potential confusion so you know that the new name is uh, Brett Cialla. But basically, they're referring to the same organism. Um, as far as hoax, hosts go, of course, this is oak. Um, oaks, the genus uh, Quercus, um, of which there are many, many different species. Um, we believe that it's likely that all species are capable of being infected with oak wilt. It's definitely true that not all oak species have been um, you know, tested in this capacity, but um, thus far it's been found that they're all certainly capable of being infected. Now that being said, um, there is quite a bit of difference in resistance depending on what species of oak uh, you're actually dealing with. And um, oftentimes the sort of oak group is divided into sort of three groups, the red oaks, the white oaks, and the live oaks. It's going to be the red oak group that's going to be most severely affected by oak wilt. And I'll mention a few reasons of why that is um, in the presentation. Okay, so as far as how does the, um, you know, how does the disease move around, it does have insect vectors. Um, there are actually several different species that have been implicated in um, spreading oak wilt spores from infected to healthy trees. We believe that the nitidula beetles are going to be the most important, but also just generally oak bark beetles um, have been shown to be able to also spread infection. And there are several species of these organisms, and they're also quite small. Okay, so they're very difficult to actually see unless you have magnification. And for that reason, they're not especially a very useful sort of diagnostic tool. Um, to try to see if a, a tree actually has oak wilt because they're, they're pretty difficult to find. And also their presence doesn't necessarily mean that that tree does have oak wilt. Okay, they could just be present um, on the tree normally. Um, it's also really important to note that oak wilt can spread without the insect help. And that's gonna be through root grafts. Okay, so basically what a root graft is is when you have two trees growing next to each other, typically two oak trees of the same species their roots might actually make a connection, okay? It's sort of a, um, uh, it's, a it's a tool that a lot of woody tree species use to sort of share resources and um, sort of survive in adverse conditions. Unfortunately, it's also a good way for some of these wilt pathogens to spread from um, host to host. So um, there's two main ways we believe this, this oak wilt is spreading. Um, long distance dissemination via these insect vectors but then really importantly is gonna be the short distance movement um, via root grafts. Okay, so this issue of um, is oak native or is it non-native is a really interesting question. Um, and it's a little bit controversial. The, it's, the answer isn't as quite as clear cut as some really well documented, documented invasive um, pathogens such as Dutch elm disease, um, chestnut blight, things like that, where we definitely know sort of where they came from. Um, with oak wilt, it was first reported in the 1940s in Wisconsin, and of course it's spread since there, and I'll show you a map of that shortly here. Um, and it's not, to this point, been found outside the United States, okay? So um, just based on that, you might conclude that, well, perhaps it is native. Um, however, when folks have looked at the, um, the actual diversity of this fungal pathogen, pathogen, they found that it's been fairly limited, okay, which um, suggests that it went through sort of a genetic bottleneck um, before it got to, or as it got to North America, which you find with a lot of invasive pathogens. And also the fact that these trees, which are native to, you know, to um, North America, especially these red oak trees, really have almost no resistance to it, which is another characteristic that we typically associate with invasive pathogens. So um, I believe the sort of prevailing opinion at the moment is that this is a pathogen that is probably invasive, probably not native. Um, there's some speculation it might've come from Mexico, South America, based on some similar fungi there, but um, it's not been sort of conclusively proven um, one way or another at this point. Okay, so just a little bit about the um, disease cycle here. So uh, here we have, um, a dead oak tree that's been uh, potentially killed by oak wilt. It will form um, fruiting structures, which I'll show you a picture of in a bit here. And these fruiting structures actually have a sort of um, ripe fruit smell to them, which is attractive to some of these beetles, especially these nitidula beetles. So they're attracted to these 
um, spore mats. They will uh, colonize the dead tree. They will um, basically get, the, get into contact with these spores and then potentially move them when they contact um, uh, living trees. And typically with it's sort of wounded living trees that they're gonna be most able to um, cause infection uh, on. And so that's how these um, long distance dissemination is working. But then as I mentioned, very, very important is the potential root to root spread through grafts, um, especially with the red oaks, which tend to um, form these uh, more frequently than some other species. All right, so um, this is a map of uh, sort of most current distribution. It was um, you know, as of about a year uh, old data. So um, where we are, of course, in Minnesota is up by close to kind of the northern range of oak wilt, which is, of course, in the red um, here. Um, so you can see oak wilt mainly a Midwestern and then um, kind of touching on sort of the eastern um, coast here, especially in the Appalachians. And then also a very important issue uh, in, um, in Texas. Um, I will mention quickly that for some folks maybe who are really on the eastern coast, there are some uh, documented cases in New York, um, Long Island, and things like that, which are not sort of um, depicted in this map. So you're going to want to find some more um, uh, specific local information there. Um, okay, so uh, as first detectors, you're probably wondering what should I be looking for uh, when it comes to oak wilt and potentially identifying it. So I'm going to go through this in a number of different ways, starting with how the canopy might actually appear. Um, so, you know, how you might actually recognize it by viewing the sort of whole tree. In Minnesota, we typically start to see symptoms of oak wilt around about midsummer. So that's around the you know, late June uh, in Minnesota. But depending on where you live, you know, especially in the farther south, you might see this earlier. Okay, and um, if it's a tree in the red oak group, I'm just going to close the windows here, someone's mowing outside. Okay, so if it's in the red oak group, uh, it's been sort of often described as sort of a whole canopy effect, maybe kind of starting in the top of the canopy first, and then working its way down but you will see fairly rapid wilting of the whole canopy and um, certainly death within one year if a red oak is infected. Um, and in some cases, maybe as quickly as about three to four weeks. Um, so that's a fairly um, severe disease when you think of some of these very large and long-lived, typically long-lived trees. Uh, trees in the white oak group, which will also sort of include um, the bur oaks in this case, um, it's a, definitely a much slower wilting process. It will often appear to be more scattered in the canopy, so it may be um, sort of localized to individual branches. And um, trees in this group uh, can definitely live several years, if not longer, being infected with oak wilt. And you may lose sort of a branch or two every year. Um, and uh, it's gonna be one of those factors that contributes to the stress of the tree that when combined with other stresses certainly can you know, lead to the death of the tree. So um, the last group here, the live oaks, which of course we don't have in Minnesota. So um, my, uh, my knowledge of uh, oak wilt and live oaks is, is not so direct and personal, but um, from what I've heard from folks in especially places like Texas is that the wilting can be fast, you know, similar to red oaks, or it can be more slow, okay? So um, it can be maybe a little bit harder to predict how uh, things will play out. But definitely it's important to know that wilting um, can be fast and they can die certainly within a year. Okay, so looking at individual leaves, you know, um, it's important to remember that this is a vascular wilt pathogen. So it's impeding the ability of the tree to get them to get the water it needs from the roots to the leaves. So um, symptoms are going to sort of appear to be, you know, um, what you might expect through drought. Right? And so with the red and white oaks, you will see the sort of marginal uh, necrosis that is the more typical sort of symptom. Okay, so for red oaks, of course, red oaks have the more pointy lobes, right? So you can kind of tell red oaks and white oaks apart. Um, again, that's going to be fairly rapid. And uh, with the white oaks, you know, it, it takes a little bit longer and it probably, in some cases, it might appear to be actually more vein delimited. So you can see in this case, the sort of mid vein is 
um, dividing some green tissue and some brown tissue. Um, and then interestingly, live oaks have a, um, a symptom that is probably more, I would say, more characteristic of oak wilt compared to things like drought stress, where you can actually get necrosis and necrosis in the actual veins um, themselves, right? So that's going to be a really interesting symptom on live oaks that we're just not seeing up in this northern um, area. And I've also um, heard that, you know, symptoms don't always look like this in live oaks. It can appear to be more marginal um, in some cases. All right, so um, getting a bit further into the tree, uh, there are some, and also I would say to be, a, it gets a little bit more specific in this case. One of the next things to look for if you have a suspected case of oak wilt would be actually to try to peel off some of the bark on the tree, especially on branches that are actively wilting. And um, oak wilt is oftentimes characterized by having a discoloration, which is sort of gray in appearance. Okay, you can see it right in the middle here, and then um, also in this branch on the right. And it's fairly streaky, okay, so that it tends to go, um, you know, in the direction of the um, vascular flow of the tree. But the edges of it are not very distinct, okay? And um, so that's what I mean by sort of diffuse, in that it doesn't have really sharp boundaries between stained areas and unstained areas, all right? Okay, and then another sort of way of looking at um, the wood of the tree, of course, looking at a cross section, you may see um, sort of uh, more discoloration in some of those annual grains. And again, this will be more of a gray discoloration. Okay, so um, a bit farther along in the disease cycle of the tree, and uh, this is going to be something that we're typically just seeing in red oaks, okay? Or it's going to be the formation of what we call spore mats, right? Um, oak wilt it has been documented to form spore mats in some cases on things like bur oaks, um, maybe other white oaks, but very, very rarely, okay? Whereas in red oaks, this is going to be much more common, okay? Um, and this, these spore mats will typically form after the tree has been killed by oak wilt. And we would expect to see them maybe the following spring after tree has, um, has died um, the, the year before. Or potentially you might see them a few months later the same year that a tree died. Perhaps if it died more early on in the summer, you might see them in the fall, okay? Um, the first thing to look for here would be, you can see a picture on the left, you get these sort of inconspicuous cracks in the bark, okay? And what that actually is, is the fungus will form these pressure pads which can actually push up the bark and cause that separation. Um, and the reason they want to do that, of course, is they're trying to attract um, the actual beetles so that it can be disseminated. And then if you were to take, you know, look at that crack and peel away some of the bark, um, maybe with your hand or with a knife, something like that, um, this is what you would expect to see from a spore mat. It will be um, sort of an area of dark discoloration, sort of round or maybe diamond shaped, and then if it's active, it'll have kind of a gray sort of um, mat of um, sexual spore producing uh, material in, in the middle. And it oftentimes will have kind of a, 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 an odor of ripe sort of fermenting fruit, okay, which is another um, important thing to check for. All right, so I would say of every, all the symptoms I've talked about so far, this is gonna be the one that's gonna be most distinctive for oak wilt um, and gonna be the one that you see, you're gonna say, well, that has to be um, sort of oak wilt, right? Okay, so um, getting into that a little bit more, oak wilt is actually not, it can be in some cases, especially when you have dead red oaks with spore mats, um, or other sort of really characteristic symptoms. Um, you know, because there's not a lot of things that can kill red oaks that quickly, but especially a lot of the other um, types of oaks, oak wilt is not always that easy to diagnose, okay? And um, it's one of the reasons that it's a very common type of sample for us in the clinic, because we get a lot of samples from homeowners as well as tree care people, arborists, that have a sample, uh, and they have a tree that they're, they're, they're interested in, and they think it might be infected with oak wilt, but they just can't tell themselves, and so they need um, that testing. All right, but before I talk about how we actually test them, I wanna talk about um, some of the lookalikes that we commonly see 
um, in oaks that have been sort of, um, people see them and they think that it might actually be oak wilt when it's actually not. Okay, so first of all, um, just wanna mention a little bit about the wood. This is um, a branch that's been freshly cut. Okay, so I just cut it with a knife and took a picture immediately. Um, five minutes later, this is that same branch, okay? So as you can see, um, that living oak wood was, is gonna oxidize quite quickly, right? And so the best time to actually look for that gray discoloration is gonna be right after cutting with a knife. I wouldn't you know, recommend um, just putting it aside and looking at it later, it's gonna be harder to see. And also I don't want folks to think that that sort of oxidation reaction is um, the oak wood itself. All right, another thing we see quite commonly um, on oak trees that are submitted to us are um, things uh, like insect activity, specifically in Minnesota here, we have the two-line chestnut borer, which uh, can cause a lot of problems for um, shade trees. And uh, it's not uncommon for us to find this insect activity when we're looking for um, the discoloration caused by uh, oak wilt. So um, a couple of different things to look for if you're, if you're confused about you know, what the discoloration is actually caused by. So on the left here, you can see some, um, some staining that's going sort of um, you know, perpendicular to the path of the wood. Uh, and of course, these are insect galleries, right? And of course, as we mentioned with oak wood, it's gonna be typically streaking down parallel with the wood and not like this, right? Another thing to look for is with the insect um, galleries and discoloration you see with insects, oftentimes they make these sort of meandering tunnels. Okay, so you can see in this case, it was going down, then it made a 90 degree turn and then made another one. Okay, so they can be kind of sort of maze-like. You can see another one sort of up here in appearance, right? Um, yet another thing to look for is that with these insect areas of discoloration, the boundary between discolored and um, not discolored area is typically sharper. Okay, so you can see that, that boundary between the dark and the white line is going to be more distinct, which if you recall from the oak wilt is more of a distinct, uh, a diffuse sort of um, boundary. Okay, and of course, um, dead wood and wood that's been killed by cankers, um, other reasons, is going to be quite dark brown in appearance, right? So um, don't confuse that with the sort of diffuse gray that we're looking for uh, with the oak wilt. All right, so that was some wood lookalikes. Let's talk about some leaf lookalikes. Um, you know, I mentioned two-line chestnut borer. Um, this is uh, what it can look like on a white oak when you have fairly heavy infection with two-line chestnut borer. So you can see uh, we got some dead branches. We have some branches and leaves that are browning. Certainly, if you're an arborist and you're looking at that tree um, from the distance, I really don't think you're going to be able to um, tell the difference distinctly between oak wilt and uh, two-line chestnut borer. And so really what they need to do at that point is to you know, collect this branch, um, have it actually tested uh, in a laboratory. So very similar symptoms, um, especially with the white oak group from insect activity and from, from oak wilt. All right, um, getting into some other fungal pathogens here, which can cause uh, interesting symptoms that have been confused with oak wilt. Here we have oak anthracnose, which is a fungus that um, is relatively common and is going to be more affecting the actual leaf, potentially the twig of um, the oak tree. So as you can see here, uh, the picture on the left, we have um, some anthracnose symptoms. And in some cases, it's looking fairly marginal. So um, I can certainly see why somebody would be confused as if this was you know, anthracnose or oak wilt. Um, you know, if you have a microscope and you know what to look for, you can actually see some of the fruiting structures of the, of the anthracnose on the actual leaf itself. So that is one um, thing to, to, to look for if you, um, if you have that available. Another interesting sort of um, difference between anthracnose and oak wilt is that oftentimes with anthracnose, you can get infection kind of early in the growing season of oak. You know, um, young leaves as they're growing are, are more vulnerable than older leaves. And also when these young leaves are infected, which are showing, showing sort of here on the right, it will actually, you know, it's infecting the leaf, it's killing leaf tissue, and that will affect the growth pattern of that leaf. 
and it will lead to kind of a distorted appearance as the leaf continues to grow. So that's another kind of thing to look for if the leaves are actually had that sort of curled kind of distorted appearance. All right, moving on to another um, oak foliar pathogen. Here we have tubacchia leaf spot, fairly common on oaks. Um, you know, looking at this picture on the top left, you can see that it definitely does have a more of a distinctive kind of spotting appearance, which you wouldn't necessarily expect with oak wilt. Um, but if you get enough infection of the leaf, you know, you can get those spots coalescing, which can cause the whole leaf to die or, you know, a big portion of the leaf, which can oftentimes um, you know, be confused with, uh, with oak world as well. All right, um, another um, fungal foliar pathogen here. This is burr oak blight, also known as Bob. Um, this is something that we're seeing in the Midwest, and it's definitely become more of an issue in the last 10 years, I would say. Uh, one thing about this is it is, you know, it is specific to bur oaks, so you're not going to see it um, in white oaks or red oaks. Very, very rarely there's a similar species that can cause an effect, but um, well, really it's going to be something you would predict with bur oaks. Um, what to look for with bur oak blight? You know, the necrosis you find from it uh, can be sort of marginal appearance, and it is, um, in a lot of cases, sort of vein delimited as well, okay? And again, this is one where if you did have a microscope and you know what to look for, um, you could actually see some of the fruiting structures from, uh, from the burrow plate. All right, another fungal pathogen here, uh, Botryosphaeria twig canker. This is a fungal pathogen that's primarily going to be infecting twigs, uh, petioles, but also the smaller branches of the oak tree. And when that happens, it will kill that area and then all the leaves that are attached to it will also die. And so the appearance of an oak tree that has Botryosphaeria twig canker oftentimes will have, it might look otherwise healthy, but it'll have sort of random scattered tufts of leaves that are brown. Whereas leaves that are right next to it may appear to be green right, which you wouldn't necessarily expect with oak will, at least if they're on the same branch. Okay, so that can be um, one thing to look for if you're trying to tell the difference between the two. Okay, um, another pathogen, in this case a bacterial pathogen, bacterial leaf scorch. This is another uh, wilt pathogen. So uh, as you might expect, the symptoms of it can be very similar to oak wilt. Um, you can see a couple of cases here. One thing that in some cases with bacterial leaf scorch you can see is um, if you look at the areas of necrosis and then the green areas, in between those um, two zones, in some cases with bacterial leaf scorch, you can see this sort of yellow kind of line, right? Uh, which is um, a little bit more distinctive of bacterial leaf scorch than I would say with oak will. And then, you know, bacterial leaf scorch compared to some of these other pathogens certainly can be more important in that it is a wilt pathogen and it can potentially lead to the death of the tree. Typically not as severe as oak wilt, certainly not on, on red oaks um, in comparison. And so it might take several years, if not longer, for something like bacterial leaf scorch to actually kill a tree. And um, you, you may see it sort of confined to individual branches um, uh, and that sort of reappear to have this appearance you know, from year to year. But again, it, um, this isn't something that you can really tell apart uh, easily because uh, even with a microscope, you can't really see the bacteria uh, in the infected tissue. One thing to look for, I guess, in this case would be you wouldn't expect to see the, the discolored wood um, as you would when you had oak wilt. All right, and another, of course, um, maybe more obvious one is simply drought stress. Um, you know, we had, um, quite a bit of rain last year, so not a lot of drought stress, at least in Minnesota, but there have been certainly years where we've had really hot, dry summers and uh, oak trees over time, it takes a while because these are big trees with fairly deep roots, um, they can certainly become stressed and the symptoms can appear very similar to what you would expect with oak wilt. Um, one thing this leads to, this drought stress is sort of early color change, so it appears as if fall is sort of coloring early to some of these trees. Um, at least in here in, in our clinic, we definitely see typically a surge of um, oak samples submitted for potential oak wilt uh, 
around the sort of early fall when you're having a more stressful type of, of condition because perhaps you have a homeowner who sees their oak tree kind of browning, um, turning yellow earlier than they would have expected. Maybe all the rest of the oak trees look okay and they get suspicious for oak weld and they really want to get that, um, that tested. So not unusual to have trees that are simply just suffering drought stress um, or other sort of abiotic stress uh, submitted for oak weld testing. All right, so um, I wanna share with you now a little bit of data that we, um, we collected from last year. Essentially, this is a snapshot of all the oak samples we got last year. Um, and um, sort of what, uh, you know, what issues we were seeing. Okay, so um, this is from last year. So it should, it's a mistake here. It should say 2019 oak diagnoses. I apologize for that. We had just over 200 different oak samples. Um, and you know, in Minnesota, we're predominantly seeing bur oaks, white oaks, and then red oaks. And again, as I said, we, we don't have live oaks up here. But um, on, the, um, on the left here, you can see part of the graph that I'm showing. This is of those trees, you know, the different groups of uh, different types of trees, which of them actually tested positive for oak weld. So as you can see, just over half of the submitted red oaks that we received in the clinic did test positive for oak weld. But um, only about 15% of burr and white oaks actually, you know, that were submitted. And it's true that not all of these trees were submitted with the, um, you know, the oak wilt being the prime, you know, um, concern. A lot of times people submit something and they say, well, can you test for Bob? And then we'll also run an oak wilt test, um, for example. But for the most part, most of these samples were, were submitted with the, um, the goal of doing an oak wilt test to try to determine if that's what's going on. Okay, so what is actually happening with some of these trees if they didn't have oak wilt? Well, I've, I've put it by category here. You can see some of these pathogens that we've, we've talked about with spocky leaf spot, very common on white oaks last year. Uh, Bob, of course, bur oak light, we only are finding on bur oaks. That's why it's only listed on only the blue um, bar there. Of course, insect tunnels that I've talked about, abiotic stresses. You know, we didn't have a lot of drought um, last year for oaks because we had record rain, but there are other types of stresses such as nutrient stress, potential herbicide drift, um, other types of things. And then of course, anthracnose and then Botryosphaeria. All right, so last year, especially for us, because of all the rain that we were having, which is really, um, tends to be fairly good for some of these foliar fungal pathogens, we were seeing a lot of oaks that were submitted by people who were suspecting oak wilt and wanted to get that tested and it, as it turned out didn't actually have oak wilt. There was something else that was going on and causing um, confusing symptoms. Okay so hopefully by now um, I've made the sort of you know point that oak wilt is not always easy to diagnose. All right especially um, if it's not a red oak that has been killed and has formats. Okay, with white oak, certainly, there's a lot of other things that can lead to symptoms that we would um, you know, sometimes associate with oak wilt. And that's why lab level confirmation can be um, really critical. So what we try to do in the lab is actually isolate and grow out the actual fungal pathogen and identify that based on um, its uh, morphological characteristics. And in some cases, we can actually do a DNA test as well um, to try to get that identification. All right, so um, if you're wondering where uh, a lab is actually located that uh, will sort of serve your area, you can go to the um, National Plant Diagnostic Network, npdn.org, um, and then there is a map on that uh, homepage. You can click on uh, the state that you live in, and it should take you to a directory of um, where the actual clinics are, the website, physical location, emails, cell phone number, et cetera, et cetera. I would definitely recommend trying to work with the clinic that is in your state. Um, in the United States, at least, basically all states have, have a clinic that will serve them. In some cases, maybe more than one. For example, Florida may have um, several. But um, you know, those are the folks that are gonna be most familiar with the diseases that are in your area, okay? And they're gonna be potentially the ones who can best serve you. Um, you know, and some, some clinics actually will offer free service if you're an in-state client, so you might want to look into that. And then also in general, it's not a great idea to be sending plant pathogens, you know, from state to state, especially ones um, if they're not present already in that state. So just as a rule of thumb, 
it's best to work with a clinic that is um, going to be more local to your area. Okay, so um, with that in mind, if you are potentially trying to collect a sample for lab testing, good high quality samples are really fundamentally, crit fundamentally critical. Um, we'll, we always say that our testing is only going to be as um, reliable as the sort of sample that we uh, initially received. So um, a couple of things to think about as you're uh, potentially collecting samples. Number one is that um, we really need living branches to test from, okay? And the reason for that is a dead branch, maybe even a branch that is dead because it was killed by oak wilt, it can be very difficult to actually find the oak wilt pathogen in there. Um, one of the reasons for that is it's not a particularly good saprophyte, so it can't compete very well with all the other fungi that come into dead wood. Um, and so even if it was killed by oak wilt, it can be very difficult to actually isolate from that dead branch, right? So it's very important to have living branches. And it's pretty easy to tell if a branch of oak is living, it should appear sort of white when you peel off the bark or, you know, white and then discolored and it'll have some moisture to it, okay? So dead branches will be dark sort of red brown underneath and they'll feel fairly dry. So it can be, it can even feel more difficult to cut and to peel the actual bark off of a dead branch. Um, we do like them to be at least half an inch in diameter here, at least in our clinic, half an inch to an inch in diameter. Um, it's very difficult to work with, you know, just twigs that have been collected and, and mailed to us um, to actually reliably isolate uh, the fungus out. And then um, also one of the things we recommend is to actually collect samples during the active wilting season, okay? So um, the reason for that is because if you have a tree that has oak wilt, typically it's not uniformly distributed in that tree. So it might be in several branches, it might be in the main trunk, but it might not necessarily be in every single branch. And so if you had a tree that you were suspicious of perhaps, but you didn't get around to it, and maybe in the winter you thought, well, my tree is being pruned anyway, so why don't I send some branches in? There's a fairly high chance that even if that tree had oak wilt, the branches that you ended up collecting, which were more or less random, I guess, because it's not the active wilting season, would not potentially have oak wilt. And then the test would be a, um, what we call it a false negative effect, and that the result would be negative, but the tree would actually still be infected. So that's why we recommend sending during the active, collecting during the active wilting season, because though you're gonna be able to see what branches actually have some of the wilting leaves, um, and that is gonna be because that oak wilt fungus is actually in that branch. Okay, so it's a much more reliable sample. All right, having said that, there's a very important caveat that has to be um, borne in mind is that um, these insects that spread oak wilt typically are relying on wounds to get into the tree, right? They're not very good at actually wounding the tree themselves, unlike some other maybe um, types of insect pests that we think about. So typically they're gonna be attracted to wounds, all right? So what do you do when you collect an oak wilt sample? What do you do when you collect branch? Well, you're creating wounds on that tree, right? And so it would not be a good situation to you know, because you're trying to care for your tree and collecting a sample, and maybe that tree is negative, but by the act of collecting the sample, you've allowed it to become infected um, with, uh, with an insect carrying the oak wilt pathogen. So the recommendation in this case is to immediately cut that um, coat, that cut surface, uh, that branch stub, whatever it is you've, you've cut, with either a latex paint, spray paint, or some sort of shellac or a pruning paint, to basically um, you know, cover that cut surface to prevent the beetles from being attracted to it. Okay, so these beetles, um, they can smell uh, the, the volatile chemicals that oaks release when they're wounded incredibly well. And um, I know in, in research studies, they've been found to be attractive and they'll, they'll show up to cut surfaces within 10, 15 minutes of them being cut. Okay, so they can really hone in on those areas quickly so that's why you really want to immediately cut, coat them uh, with some sort of paint to cover it. And that will apply also, you know, if you have a tree, a living oak tree that's in an area where potentially oak wilt is a problem and it gets wounded for some reason, maybe a construction equipment goes by it, 
or um, you know, a branch gets broken for some reason, trying to cover those wounds quickly um, with some sort of pain or shellac is important. Um, and then, so basically what we do, as I mentioned with the, with the branch, is we will try to actually isolate the fungus directly from the wood. So we'll basically you know, carefully peel the bark off, we'll look for areas of discoloration, we'll sample from those areas, and then we'll try to actually get it to grow um, so that we can identify it. So that means that we need um, the sample to be treated relatively delicately, um, you know, to try to keep it cool and at least submit it relatively soon after collecting. Um, definitely don't want to be putting it in a truck for a few days and allowing it to get hot in the sun um, before you get around to bring it to the clinic. That's definitely not a good situation. You know, it's okay probably if you're bringing it inside overnight and then you bring it into the clinic the next day. Um, that's typically still going to be an okay sample, but um, it's definitely important to, to try to um, not let that wood get exposed to really high temperatures or to dry out. That's going to make it difficult to actually isolate them. Okay, so um, with that in mind, uh, getting to some oak wilt management uh, techniques. This is a disease that, um, you know, because potentially the, uh, the insect vectors are important in spreading at long distance, but because they're not perhaps as efficient as some other types of insect vectors, other types of diseases, um, the ability to actually interrupt their ability to infect the tree can be very important. And um, you know, getting into what I mentioned with coating the, uh, the wounds with paint, trying not to prune your oak trees during the active beetle season um, can be, um, is really one of the most important things you can do to try to stop a new oak wilt infection center from appearing. So again, this is Minnesota I'm talking about here. This is our typical season. April through June is gonna be the highest risk season where you definitely don't wanna be pruning if you can avoid it, right? Um, March, July, and October, March, July, and then July to October, so July, August, September, October, that's more low risk. I mean, the beetles might be active. And so, you know, if you are pruning, you'd still, um, You'd want to be uh, you know, coating those surfaces, things like that. Um, and then also, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this, but you know, making sure with that pruning equipment to sterilize, uh, dip it in 10% bleach, some sort of disinfectant, certainly between oak trees, between two different trees, can be an important tool in preventing spread of oak wilt. But then in Minnesota, November, December, January, February, as you may know, it gets quite cold in Minnesota during those months and the beetles are not active. And that is considered to be the really the safest time um, for pruning oak trees. And also it's, it tends to be healthier for the tree to do the pruning um, at that time anyway. So it's, it's really where um, you see most of the activity. But again, this is Minnesota. So what I wanna quickly to really emphasize is that if you're not in Minnesota, you're really gonna to want to look into your own local guidance on this. When is the actual safe time to prune? Um, some of these oak trees. Uh, with that in mind, you know, we in our, our plant disease clinic website, we actually have what's called a widget. And so this gets updated when we change from safe to low risk to high risk. And so folks can actually look at our website to see, at least in Minnesota, if it's been, um, you know, the beetles have become active or if they're going dormant or, or whatever. Okay, um, another really important management tool is in preventing spread is definitely not moving firewood of oak wilt infected trees. And you've probably heard of this phenomenon with a lot of different tree pathogens and pests is that they get moved around a lot, just simply people moving firewood. You know, they cut down a tree uh, at their cabin, they bring it home, it's firewood or vice versa in there. Uh, it's a you know, really easy way of moving disease from an area that is infected to an area that is, hasn't had it. Um, so that's definitely um, important to bear in mind. I would say in general, don't really try to move firewood at all. Um, try to buy it locally. And with red oaks, even if you have a tree that's died from oak wilt and it's on your property and you're wondering, well, can I cut it down and then can I save the firewood? Um, generally, the answer is, uh, no, unless you're doing some sort of treatment of that wood 
because what can happen is you can cut it down and it's in logs and the spore mats will still appear and then you have a great inoculum source for all the other potential oaks uh, in your area. So the recommendation is either to burn it um, soon after cutting either or to debark it um, so that you know that area between the bark and the um, sapwood isn't conducive for, for um, spore mat appearance or to um, actually cut up the firewood, stack it up and put a tarp over it during the time um, when the beetles are active to prevent them from actually getting out and, and spreading, the, um, spreading the disease around. Okay, um, other sort of management tool, um, chemical management. You know, there is a method of treating, potentially treating trees that um, as a preventative, typically as a preventative to prevent them from being infected with oak wilt. Uh, if it's a red or live oak, that's really the only recommendation um, for some of these, these tools. If a tree is actually already showing symptoms from oak wilt, it's thought that it's too late for the tree and injecting with this fungicide is not gonna help that tree. Uh, oak wilts, I mean, excuse me, white oak can be a bit different. You do see some therapeutic use of some of these injectable fungicides. Uh, with white oaks and it's thought that it can you know help prolong the life of the tree in some cases. Um, typically though you only see this on high value trees. What happens is that um, you know someone has to go in and scrape the soil off around the root flare, drill little holes in the root flare and then hook it up to this sort of hose apparatus where then you'll inject um, the um, tree with a uh, fairly high quantity of, of um, fungicide in solution and so typically this costs usually several hundred dollars um, from a tree care company to do. And it's quite difficult um, for a homeowner to do themselves and to have the sort of necessary equipment um, to do unless they're gonna make a, um, uh, an investment in that. So you only really see it for the most part in, in high value trees. Um, another uh, good preventative management tool is this idea of trying to disrupt some of those root grafts. And so um, oftentimes you see these sort of uh, tools, these root trenching tools. They're either these big vibratory blades that get sort of dragged through the ground at a depth of uh, about five feet. Um, and so that will basically be used if you have an infected tree to um, you know, make a circle around that tree and disrupt the potential root grafts it might have with healthy trees. And also the, the best recommendation is to draw another secondary circle around the other trees in a wider radius that aren't, don't have symptoms yet. Because the idea is that, well, you may have missed some of that um, or it might already be infected but not showing symptoms and that to really stop that potential new infection center from, from becoming a big problem, it's best to have uh, at least you know, a secondary circle as well. Um, you also see some of this root trenching being done before a tree is removed. So um, you know, to try to disrupt some of those root grafts before an infected tree is taken down, because it's thought that if a tree is infected and it gets removed, especially in the sort of um, you know, active part of the growing season, it might be more likely for the fungus to actually move via the root grass into some healthy trees. Okay. But of course, this isn't always an option, especially if you're an urban homeowner and you have you know, infrastructure buildings around sidewalks. Um, so you may not, this might not be possible for everybody. Okay, so I wanted to say a few words um, about the first detector program and um, its importance with oak wilt. So I think oak wilt is really a, a, a disease that the first detector program is really well suited to help with. Um, oak wilt is a disease that is, is quite important, but um, doesn't necessarily spread that quickly once you have an infection center. Okay, again, as we said, the insect vectors are not that efficient. And so mainly it's, it's, it's the insect vectors causing new circles outside of the, the current distribution map, but then it's really gonna be the grafting that is gonna cause that oak wilt to spread um, from season to season. And it's gonna be you know, 70 to 100 feet per year, uh, potentially that that grafting is gonna um, potentially spread. So we do have an opportunity to interrupt the formation of these new infection circles and to stop them from becoming a bigger problem. 
And having first detectors out there that can potentially look for oak world infected trees and to get that information to forest health specialists and federal and state agencies so that they can actually go in and try to manage those areas, I think is really, um, is really gonna be crucial. So I did just wanna quickly, let's see here, um, show you what that looks like uh, if you haven't already. So um, going to the firstdetector.org, report a pest. So it's um, clicking and report a pest. You will then uh, select your Hi, Brett, we can't see if you're, you might have to sh change the screen that you're sharing. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Let me see here. Let me see. Actually, what I'll, I'll just, what I'll do is, um, I'll just walk you through the slides I already have for it. Okay, so here's the First Detector website. Um, you'll click Report a Pest. That will bring you to a page where you can actually just, oh, excuse me. Um, select Oak Wilt and then put in your location. And then if you do have, you know, GPS, uh, obviously that's gonna be for the best, right? And then putting that information in there and then it will get to the, um, the relevant sort of authority figures who can potentially go in and try to ground truth that, see if they can find Oak Wilt and potentially lead to that management, okay? Okay. So um, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you for attending. I do want to quickly, um, again, remind you of some of the uh, other um, uh, webinar series we'll have in the, the next couple of weeks, okay? Um, I'm happy to, in the remaining time, go through any potential questions that you might have. Yeah, we do have some questions, um, Brett, if you're able to see the question and answer box. There were some that came in earlier in your talk. Um, okay, I yep, I can see it here. So cambium, the first question I see is cambium streaking similar to verticillium wilt. Um, it can be fair, I would say it's, it can be fairly similar. Sometimes with verticillium wilt, it looks a little bit more green, you know, than gray. But yeah, I would say it can be um, similar. With verticillium wilt, of course, there are a lot more potential hosts um, than oak wilt. So at verticillium wilt has a much wider host range. Um, but yeah, the streaking can look kind of similar. Uh, leaf systems, second question here, leaf symptoms differentiate from those of anthracnose or leaf scorch. Um, hopefully- I address I that. I was gonna say, we probably should have- I think I addressed that. Um, but again, with anthracnose, you know, I would say in some cases, especially with leaf scorch, you might not be able to differentiate them. So you really do need to go to the wood, look for that gray discoloration, which would be something you'd expect with oak wilt and not with scorch. With anthracnose, um, again, it can be difficult. You know, you, you can find the anthracnose fruiting structures on the leaves um, if you have a microscope and know what to look for. And it also can look a little bit more distorted if it was an early leaf infection than oak wilt would. But you know, it's important to bear in mind that trees can be infected with multiple pathogens. And so finding anthracnose on your oak certainly is, is not an indication that it's not oak wool or, or it also doesn't have oak wool. So that's something to, to bear in mind. How easy is it to culture from the spore mats? Um, the oak wool pathogen does grow fairly easily on general types of growing media. So um, I would say it's, it's not too difficult to grow um, from the spore mats. It's fairly reliable. It can, as I mentioned before, you know, if you have really dead and degraded wood, you know, we've had cases where people have cut down trees and then after the fact, they've said, well, you know, was that oak wilt in that tree? I don't know. And they'll submit some, like a, a wedge, from the, the dead wood of a trunk. And there's all kinds of other things in there at that point, and it can be really difficult to try to make sense of it. And there's so many competing organisms and things that grow faster on the media, um, and can be really a mess. And so that's why you know it's really best to to um, to try to culture from living wood. But if you have a spore mat, even if it's on dead wood, that does it's a pretty high concentration of oak wilt for, of the of the pathogen anyway, so it can be easier to sample from. So Brett, I have a question, and I was going to ask this and then um, you, you just touched on it again, but could you explain why you do not see fruiting structures on leaves with oak wilt, but you see them with some other things? Like what is causing 
the symptoms there. So you, yeah, there, okay. yeah thanks. Um, because oak oil is basically in the vascular tissue. It doesn't really, the, the, the fungus itself doesn't get into the leaves. You, know, you see the symptoms in the leaf because the leaves aren't getting the water they need, but the actual fungus uh, isn't really thought to actually get into the leaf. And so it's really only in the, um, you know, that sap wood, that area between the bark and the sap wood that is conducive for it to form um, some of these fruiting structures. And then something I, you know, I forgot, I, I didn't get into, but you know, um, the difference between red oaks and white oaks and why red oaks are more susceptible than white oaks and why they die so much quicker. Basically, the thinking is that they just don't have the ability to stop the fungus from spreading. So trees have really interesting, in a lot of cases, abilities to stop pathogens and pests from spreading in them. They form these, these little tyloses and they block off areas and compartmentalize. And um, for whatever reason, the red oak just is really incapable of doing that. Um, and so in, any infection is basically thought to be a fatal infection for red oaks. Whereas white oaks can compartmentalize it in some cases into specific branches and can certainly slow the spread um, so that they can live uh, much longer. Other questions anybody has? So I don't see any other questions, but let, let's give people a minute if they do have any more questions for Brett. Um, let's see. I also want to mention, mention while we give people another minute if they have any parting questions. Um, and Brett, you touched upon this a couple of times throughout your talk, which I think is great. Um, it's always a good idea to talk to the person in your local lab um, to re and I, especially when it comes to dealing with um, significant samples, you know, contact them, review their, you know, preferred way to send in a sample, um, let them know that you're sending it. So especially now when things are a little bit strange with mail, um, let them know that you're sending a high risk sample so it doesn't sit um, at, you know, in the, the mail room for several days or, you know, don't send it. We also say when we talk, we do the sample submission um, talk, you know, not to send it at the end of the week where it potentially might not get delivered right to your lab um, until, you know, after the weekend. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, something we, we didn't mention, but of course, this is the era of COVID. And so things aren't always working exactly as they have been. Um, we were like, we were short staffed for a while. We're still working in, in some degree of restrictions, which makes things a bit slower. So um, it's always, yeah, definitely call people beforehand. Um, I know in our situation, we don't, clients can't come directly to the lab anymore because they can't get in the building because it's locked. Um, but we do have a drop-off site that they can use. And then they, they put it in the bin outside, they give us a call and we, we go and pick it up after they leave. So there's all kinds of new ways that people are working today um, that you just need to, to bear in mind. We did have a question here on, um, uh, question is, so is this everywhere in the mainland US? Um, so no. Let's see if I can show my slides again here. I'll go back to where I had that map again. Okay. Uh, so again, it's mainly the Midwest, Texas, and then getting into the sort of western portion of the East Coast. And I know in New York, um, they've had some recent issues um, actually on the coast as well. Yeah, I expect that those are the um, easternmost samples, I would imagine, or cases. Yeah. It's also, you know, you, see, you can see the, the, the area around Albany, New York, um, that those were earlier cases of oak wilt. And I believe there are some cases now in Canandaigua and other parts of upstate in addition to the ones on Long Island. So uh, we have one more question, free chilling samples, could it go in the freezer overnight? Um, I would say it could, I, I don't, I think a refrigerator would be better um, just to avoid that freeze thaw cycle, which can be you know, a bit tough on uh, an organism sometimes. So if, it, if, it's, if it's just short term storage, refrigeration should be fine. If you're trying to keep the sample, you know, a good sample for years, then freezing would be probably best, but just overnight or several days, refrigerator would be good. Great. Well, we're about right on schedule. 
Um, I know that a couple of samples are coming in, but let's see. I want to just mention that that Greg wants to thank you or clarify that the only time you want to use um, pruning paint is if you're trying to prevent oak wilt. So yes, that is definitely something that, or on other trees, you probably don't want to use. So, all right, I don't see any other questions. Any other final words from you, Brett, before I wrap up? Um, you did a great job. It's really great talk. Can't think of anything now, but I'm so, I'm sure as soon as I, I hit leave, I'll, I'll pick a pop. You are on Twitter, so if people want okay. to follow you or follow up with you, um, they can find you there or at the clinic um, website. Probably don't want to be broadcasting your information out to everybody. Um, but I'll start wrapping up. Everybody is saying thank you. Okay. So, yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Um, special thanks, Brett, for you, um, for your expertise and time about oak wealth. It's a really serious issue and it is continuing to spread around the US. Um, Brett is on Twitter if you want to find him there. And as he mentioned, we have some, you know, we will continue the series at least for the next several weeks and have some great speakers coming up. Uh, next week, I believe we're um, going to be learning about Asian citrus psyllid and citrus greening with Monique Rivera from UC Riverside. So um, again, this was or is being recorded. We will post that on the first detector training site. That will be on the same um, web page where you registered for this uh, talk. And there's a little bit of a learning curve with getting those posted, so I apologize. But the first one is posted, the Diagnostics 101 lecture. So check that out if, if you didn't see that or watch it again if you did. So again, thanks, Brett. Thanks, everybody else, for joining us. And um, enjoy the rest of your week. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everybody. Take care.